Um, first thing, I would like to ask everybody if you are not muted to mute yourself so that we can't hear your paper shuffling or anything like that. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. I know we have some new students this semester. I am Sarah Velasquez. I am the um, project manager for the communications core. You will hear from me and see me often, I'm sure. Um, you may get emails from me. There will be, um, I post on all the social media. We, uh, you'll see me at the symposium when you go to the symposium. So if you uh, see my name, this is my face, and feel free to email me at any time with questions about Cambry or anything you need. And um, Ryan Spaulding is also here. He is the director of the communications core, so you might see him around too. And then today we have um, Dr. Um, Doug Wright presenting. He is the principal investigator for the Cambry. And he will be telling you a little bit about more about the program and what the expectations are. We have this seminar every month, on, usually on the first Thursday of the month. So there will be another seminar in October on how to write an abstract, which will be useful for the symposium. And another seminar in November about conflict resolution. So be prepared to attend those the first Thursday of those months. So now I will hand it over to Dr. Wright. Hello, everybody. How are you? I am uh, speaking to you from the comfort of my office in Kansas City. Um, this is a very awkward sort of seminar uh, to give because it's hard to get feedback. Um, normally, I will tell a couple of stupid jokes and you get the audience to laugh and I, I feel more comfortable, but I'm basically looking at my screen, so it's a little weird. Um, First of all, how many first-time uh, students do we have in the audience that are doing research? Can you raise your hand? Just give me a show of your, my hand. How many uh, are first-time in doing research? So a couple, and then we've got some, some, some folks that are experienced. How many faculty do we have? Raise your hand if you're a faculty. Can't see everybody. Okay, so we have a number of different faculty, um, and uh, thanks for joining in. Uh, I'm just going to kind of give an introduction to the, the INBRI program, um, a little bit about the details of it, some of our expectations for the students, uh, our goals and ambitions, and you'll see that the program is actually quite broad. Um, this, the student aspect is actually just one of many different things that we do to stimulate research in the state of Kansas. Um, so, uh, the Kimbrey is a, federally funded uh, program. Uh, it is now housed in the National Institute of General Medical Sciences within NIH. Um, it's been in existence since about the year 2000, uh, probably started uh, a little bit before that, but the first grants were given in 2000, and Kansas was one of the original grant members. Um, the money that is allocated for this program is actually quite unique. Uh, most of the research funds that we get as, a, as an investigator, including myself, I would apply to NIH funds, and they go through the National Institutes of Health through the 27 different institutes. My own personal grants are funded by the National Institute of Neurological Disease, NINDS, um, but the money for the INRI program, for the IDEA program, uh, actually comes from a different pool of money. It's actually federally mandated and has to be approved every year. So that is a unique situation for our particular program because it needs the support of Congress in order for us to uh, receive money. Fortunately, there's a lot of support, uh, uh, both in the Congress and the House, on, in, from both parties, to support this program. So we've been in, a, in a existence uh, for 17 years. It's been a program that uh, we started in 2000. This is our 17th year. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about more about the, the, the different aspects of the program, but um, suffice it to say, the goal of our particular program is to support research, stimulate research in the state of Kansas. Uh, one of the reasons that we receive this support is because Kansas is in the lower half of states that uh, compete for federal funding. So we don't, we don't receive as much federal funding as, uh, as the other states, we're in the lower half. And that part... Part of that, or the large region of that, is just how many people we have and how many large universities that we have. Um, so we're, we're never going to be able to compete with very large states with lots of big institutions. We'll always kind of be in the lower half. 
And so uh, Congress decided that we can't ignore these states, and they developed this individual program called the IDEA program uh, that helps support research in our particular state. And we are part of a large network. I'll talk about that. So as students and faculty, um, your job is to, uh, uh, is to carry out research. And our job is to get, the re get you the resources that uh, you need to carry that, whether that's money, that's equipment, that's whatever resources that you need. Our job is to try and find a way to get you to, to have that money. Um, this is not the right slide. I thought this was my last slide. Maybe not. Hold on. Let me see what my last slide is. Um, okay. All right. So my slide has got a little out of order. Um, that's fine. Um, I'm going to move on to the next part. We're going to come back to that. So why am I giving you guys a seminar? Well, I'm, I'm the... Uh, principal investigator of this particular program. I've been uh, involved with the program since 2010. I am currently a professor and serve as the vice chair of the Department of Anatomy and Cell Biology uh, at KU Medical Center. I've been here 20 years. I'm a neuroscientist. Uh, my lab, my office is in uh, the Hemingway building and my, my laboratory is as well. It's across the hall. I fully expect one of my graduate students to pop into my office at some point while I'm giving this talk. Um, my my research is very translational. Um, I do animal research, but I also do clinical research on human patients uh, associated with pain and neuropathy, problems with sensation. And um, most uh, scenarios that we work with are associated with diabetes. Diabetes is a disease that has many complications, including nerve damage and pain. And so m most of our time is spent studying aspects of uh, pain and sensation associated with diabetes, um, pre-diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. As I mentioned, I've been the director of, the, of this program since 2011. Uh, a couple other things that I do uh, relative to student training is I'm the, the director of graduate studies for the neuroscience graduate program. Uh, that particular program is a joint graduate program with the University of Lawrence, um, and I am the director on this particular program, and students that are working on their PhDs here at the Medical Center that want to be involved in uh, neuroscience research uh, can enter that graduate program. So if any of you students are uh, interested in neuroscientists or neuroscience, um, I'd be happy to talk to you. And then as, as well, I direct uh, research for the Diabetes Institute because of my role, uh, long-time role in studying diabetes and its complications. Um, I put a new figure on the lower right here. Uh, this is actually the view of, from my office. This is the new, new health education building. If you haven't been on our campus in a while, um, this is the new, uh, what we call the medical school education building, although there's nursing and uh, uh, allied health that's taught in there as well. Some of the graduate studies are taught in there. Um, the portion on the lower portion right here um, is actually a living roof. It's planted with plants, and then underneath that are the large auditoriums where the medical centers, medical students take their most of their courses in their first and second year. And then that part that's enclosed by glass here are all small classrooms. So much of the curriculum now is taught in a, a small group format. But this is a building that just opened this summer. Um, the new class of medical students um, have a new curriculum, um, and they are busy in there. Facility is absolutely beautiful. If you ever get a chance to visit, um, uh, take a tour of the new building. The, the technology is fabulous. I just gave a lecture over there uh, to second-year medical students, and I was standing in the middle of a very large auditorium, and students were all around me. It was really odd to sort of have that sort of format, um, but it's actually kind of cool, and the technology is great. Okay, so here is a little bit about the program. Uh, the overall program that we uh, are associated with is called the IDEA program, which is the Institutional Development and Award Program. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's funded through the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. Um, it was established by Congress in, in 93, and there are 23 states plus Puerto Rico that are, that are part of our program. Um, and these are all states that are in the lower half of NIH funding. Um, the goal of the program is to increase research competitiveness by providing support and uh, putting, building infrastructure and also developing pipelines for training researchers. So 
we are we are in a deficit because we don't have huge numbers of large institutions, um, and uh, many of the institutions in the state are, are primarily directed at undergraduate education. And so um, Congress recognized this and developed this particular program, and we work along with the other 23 states in Puerto Rico to help stimulate research in our particular states. So within this IDEA program, there are three, now three arms, this has grown uh, recently, but there are three arms to this. Uh, one of the arms is called the COBRI uh, programs. These are centers of biomedical research, and they are more focused on a particular research area. They're led by a PI that has expertise in the field, and the goal of these programs is to really help young faculty um, uh, prepare their research in order for them to be more competitive for NIH funding. And the unique aspect about the Cobris is that each of the three main institutions, KU Lawrence, uh, KU Med Center, and K-State, are eligible to have three of these. It's currently here there are three. Um, in Lawrence, I believe there are three. And K-State now has a brand new one that just started uh, a couple of months ago. Um, so we work with those COBRI programs quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of overlap and crosstalk between the programs. The program that you're in today and, and learning about is the IDEA Network of Biomedical Research Excellence, or the INBRI programs. We have one per state, um, and it's housed here uh, at KU Medical Center, but we work with a network. I'll talk about that. We work with a network of institutions across the state and in Oklahoma. A brand new arm that they, they developed a couple of years ago is called now called the Clinical and Translational Research Centers. Um, these, are these are designed to support clinical and translational research as they're titled, uh, particularly in states that don't have another um, clinical and translational program through NIH called the CTSA. Um, so if your state does not have a CTSA, um, you can apply for these particular uh, program grants. Our state, Kansas, does have a CTSA. Uh, it's housed here at KU Medical Center. It was just renewed, uh, as we learned last week, it was renewed uh, for another four years. Um, so we are not eligible for a CTR in the state of Kansas because we have a CTSA. So the map at the bottom is a, uh, a map of all of the eligible states within the IDEA program. Um, and you can see there are states that largely have uh, fewer populations and fewer large universities. Um, there are states that are close to that but have bigger um, sort of states. So, so for example, Iowa is probably similar to us, maybe uh, their population is more, but they have two very large universities, University of Iowa and Iowa State, that put them above in the top 50% of states doing that. Um, we work within a region. Um, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, and Oklahoma are all considered the central region, and we work with those states quite a bit uh, in terms of um, synergy and crosstalk, again, uh, about how to improve uh, research within our particular states. So I mentioned the COBRIs are uh, uh, program grants that are designed to support multidisciplinary centers that strengthen, strengthen research. Again, there are seven current COBRIs in, in Kansas. Uh, including the new one at K-State. Um, we're very excited about that aspect, and we're working, working closely with those folks. And if you have questions about uh, COBRI programs, uh, we certainly can, can help you with it, particularly the faculty, if you're interested in being involved in those COBRI grants. Um, there are a lot of resources available. One of the aspects of the COBRIs is to provide um, core facilities, and those core facilities should be available to most of the folks in the state. So, we can provide you information and contacts. Each of the COBRIs has a different research focus, um, and uh, uh, we're happy to provide information about that. So again, the INRI program is one per state. Uh, it has a, a scientific focus. The, our particular state has a focus in cell and developmental biology, and that allows us to have a very broad um, uh, network um, very hard for me not to believe that somebody's not doing something in cell and developmental bio biology. Um, so that allows us to capture a lot of researchers in the state. Our goal is to strengthen the expertise and the infrastructure within the state. Infrastructure might be communications, it might be um, equipment grants, uh, might be supporting young faculty or postdocs. So there's a lot of way that we can support the infrastructure. Um, 
one of the things that we want to do is promote coordination within the state and sharing of research source resources. And this is an example of one way to do that. We do it in many different aspects. Uh, probably the best known aspect that you'll, that you'll see at the end is the symposium in terms of sharing our information. And then you're here today um, because of the research opportunities for undergraduates. Um, one of the goals of each of the programs and all of the in programs is to help develop pipelines, is to get students involved in research in early phase in their career to provide them information about whether research may be something that they really like or they don't like, that's okay too, um, and to help them, provide them the information about what they're going to do with that, uh, that research experience. Are you going to go on to graduate school? Are you going to work in industry? Are you going to go to medical or veterinary school? So all of these aspects we can help you with, uh, and hopefully the mentors that you're working with in the individual laboratories are talking to you about your opportunities um, moving forward. So we, we began in 2000. Uh, we had a different name called the Kansas Brin, and then we sort of were modified now into the Inbury program. Uh, we are in its 17th year, um, and we are in a grant cycle that's in year 14 through 19. Uh, our particular grant will need to be renewed. We need to submit the renewal May 20 or March 28th uh, in 2018. So that's not that far off. We are actively working on putting together a renewal. Um, for that, for um, uh, for next March, as I mentioned, our theme is cell and developmental biology. Although we have uh, people in our network that are sort of um, on the fringe of cell and developmental biology, but we're our goal is to support really good research across the state. Uh, so we have nine universities in our network, and then we have Langston University in Oklahoma as part of our network as well. So here is our uh, how our our particular Kansas Embry is, is organized. We have three major uh, institutions, research intensive institutions that we call. KU Medical Center is the lead institution, um, but we also have K-State and KU Lawrence as partners, research intensive universities. And then across the state and in Oklahoma, we have all of the undergraduate institutions that we work very closely with. So this includes Emporia, Emporia State, Fort Hayes State, uh, Haskell Indian Nations University, Langston University, Pittsburgh State, Wichita State, and Washburn. These are all longstanding partners that have been within our network um, all 17 years, and uh, it's been great to sort of work with all the institutions and universities and faculty across the state. Um, I know that <clears throat> our state is, is a little bit different from other INBRI states um, in terms of the makeup. Other programs have a lot of involvement with community colleges and, or they might have more um, uh, other types of universities. But our, our particular network, I feel, is very strong and we're very appreciative of all the support and the interactions from all of the, all of the universities involved. Um, and I think that's a real strength of our program is we have really good people out across the state at different institutions. Uh, all the campus coordinators that you're working with are top-notch folks and uh, really have a lot of experience, and we're very thankful for all of their support. So how do we build infrastructure? How do we support research? Uh, we do it in a lot of different ways. In fact, we, we actually have 16 different ways in which we uh, support research across the state. Um, if you're a faculty member, hopefully you're aware of all of the opportunities that we have. Uh, and are applying to those. So we fund bridging grants, we fund pilot grants, uh, we, we support core facilities. Um, we have recruitment packages across the state for new faculty that are being recruited. Um, we have partnership pair awards, which is a translational uh, sort of pilot grant. Uh, we support postdocs across the state. Um, and then we support young faculty uh, in their early development. These are developmental research grants that are designed to help support faculty in the first three or four years before they get NIH awards. Um, so there are a lot of different ways. This requires a lot of coordination on our part, our part to fund these different mechanisms. Uh, but we end up spending uh, over a million dollars a year, or probably greater than that, across the state uh, to help support these particular mechanisms. So it's a pretty good chunk of money. And uh, we're, we're excited when we see folks in Kansas uh, be successful in their research. All right, so the students, uh, you're here as part of our student programs, and this can 
uh, come in various forms of uh, different programs. So we have a star trainee that's designed to support uh, seniors in their last year that have experience and really demonstrated excellence in research. Um, this is sort of a, a top-notch program to identify those particular students that are really, really good at research and enjoying it and are really doing well. Uh, many of you, I assume, are probably semester scholars that are starting your fall semester and, and working in a, very, in a research lab, being supported. Um, if you are interested in bioinformatics or translational research or community-based research, we also have other scholars programs that uh, allow you to do research in those particular endeavors. Um, and those are um, all decided uh, for the most part um, in the spring and, uh, and then also continued on throughout the semesters at the various institutions that you guys are at. So we are in our 17th year and, and we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, so we're, we're at the point now where we've, where we've supported well over a thousand undergraduates in their research. Um, and this is due in large part by the success of the campus coordinators that are with you today, uh, really keeping these programs running and also great mentors, uh, great faculty mentors across the state that have provide uh, space and resources for students in their particular laboratories. And, um, as you can imagine, we do a lot of uh, analysis of the success of the particular programs, and that's in large part what Sarah and Ryan do, is to really uh, understand whether these particular programs are being successful in terms of helping you understand what research is like, um, you know, whether you like it or not, some of the pros and cons, you know, what's a job in academia like versus a, a job in industry. Um, so that should be part of the goal. Uh, for you, this, um, this particular semester is not only to do research, but to learn about a scientific career and, and whether you like that or not. Okay, so this is an example of the kinds of information that we collect. This is information that Sarah's collected um, and that she'll be hassling you um, on a regular basis, but this is really important. So if I can just step back and sort of tell you the importance of we're very fortunate to get this money from the federal government, but we need to show what we're doing with that. We need to be responsible stewards for this particular uh, uh, gift that we get from, from the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and part of that is to understand what successes we've had. So you can imagine in our 17th year, we are kind of, uh, we are absolutely um, deter trying to determine our successes. And part of that is, through surveys and other aspects. So Sarah is constantly doing this. This is a survey that we collected from last spring from students that were exiting the program. And you can see we, we, are, uh, we are supporting students from a, from a lot of the different universities. Um, at KUMC, we don't have an undergraduate population here, but we do have undergraduates that work here in the particular summer. So that's the, the reason that we have students here at KUMC. But you can see the very diverse fields of study that we have, uh, mostly bio biology, biochemistry, and chemistry, but there's a huge range of um, different programs. A little disappointed in the neuroscience component. I think that probably needs to be a little bit bigger. Maybe we can get more of you interested in the neuroscience programs, uh, just as a personal bias on my part. Uh, <clears throat> and then I love no answer. 6% of the folks really didn't know what they were studying, so that's probably not a great sign. <laughs> we need to work on that aspect of it. Things that we're trying to get from you and things that are some of the goals of the program is how do you feel about your preparation for, for professional school? And you can see that most of the students that go through the program, really by the end when they've been through it, uh, feel pretty prepared about what, what at least positive or in a negative fashion about what, what, um, where they want to head. So that's part of the goal uh, is to really educate you on um, – and prepare you for, you know, a career in science, wherever that career is. So this is the kind of information that Sarah will be collecting from you. This is important for us. Um, and we're being compared against other programs and not only in the Embry programs, but a, a lot of the other programs. And I think that we, I know that we've been very successful. And again, this is in large part due to the great quality of students that we have and also the, the great faculty mentors that we have across the, uh, across the state. Here's an example of that. Um, you know, Sarah and, and Dr. Chapes have collected information over the years, and we know now how we're doing um, in terms of the, the goals of the particular program. This has been published uh, now. It's almost four years ago. It's about time for a couple more papers, Keith and Sarah, uh, to pop out. 
but we know about 70% of the students that are in our programs end up going to a graduate or medical school. You're, obviously, you're drawn to research to begin with, and our goal is to make sure that you're aware of the possibilities and also to prepare you and make you competitive for graduate programs or medical school programs or other health-related programs. And, uh, and we can compare ourselves to different programs across, uh, across the country, and you can see that we've been really successful in terms of really helping the students prepare, and that's, again, the goal. Uh, as I mentioned, we are within a central region. Uh, the Dakotas, Nebraska, and Oklahoma uh, are our, all part of our region. It's really sort of interesting to get a feel for what these different states are like. I think from my standpoint, the Dakotas are really different states. They have very uh, different populations within their universities. They have a, uh, a larger number of, um, of American Indian uh related schools. I can't think of the terminology right off my head. It went up right off my head. Uh, and so those are quite unique and they have their own challenges. Nebraska, Kansas, and Oklahoma are very much similar. And again, we work across those states and we meet um, every couple of years. If, if you just missed it, we were in South Dakota for a meeting this summer in June. Maybe some of you went. Did anybody go? Raise your hand. Did anybody go to South Dakota? Uh, not particularly sure. We have a couple. I know Sharon Keith did. Yes, I saw you and Bill did. Um, and the next meeting, I believe, will be in Oklahoma in 2019. So if you're still working in the particular program, that'll be an opportunity to travel to Oklahoma and present your work uh, at a, uh, a regional meeting. Generally, these have uh, two to 300 people. And so an opportunity to participate and, uh, and to show your research um, um, outside of Kansas. The other aspect that you might have an opportunity and I would encourage you to participate is there's a national meeting with all of the 23 states that get together um, every other year. Uh, the next meeting that we'll have is in June in 2018. This will be in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are fortunate or maybe unfortunate, depending on who you are, uh, to be heavily involved in this particular meeting. Uh, we are actually the organizers. The state of Kansas is the organizers for this meeting in 2018 and another one in 2020. Um, and if you're uh, involved in research, uh, we'd encourage your faculty uh, to attend the meeting and also the students. Uh, we try to make it as student friendly as possible. Did anybody go to Washington DC a couple of years ago? Any students involved in that? Uh, I had a couple faculty, uh, all, most of the faculty I know uh, were able to attend. So again, this is an opportunity to present at the national level. You're, have an opportunity to, to network with folks across the country, um, to talk to talk to folks in various graduate or, or professional programs. Uh, we do really kind of try and uh, have a focus on undergraduate um, uh, students at that particular time. There's a lot of different options to that. Um, as you'll see, and I've been showing pictures of digital poster sessions. Uh, you have an opportunity to, to present a poster in a very different kind of way using a touchscreen monitor. Um, and uh, it's really kind of a different format. And you can see these handsome folks here. I just want to show a picture of Tim just in case his students uh, hadn't seen him in a while. Um, uh, Tim, uh, Tim, I'm envious of Tim in terms of his, his, his work ethic and his ability to stay slim. So uh, good job, Tim. I can't, I'm trying to catch you as, as best I can. Okay, so our particular state uh, program is organized this. We have an administrative core. Within that core, we have a committee that makes funding decisions, and we also have an undergraduate research office, and that is led by Dr. Chapes at K Kansas State University, who's done an excellent job. We have a couple of different cores. The communication core is led by Sarah and Ryan, uh, who do a wonderful job uh, not only organizing these, but a lot of the communications across the state. One of the things that's really important for us is to share our successes with NIH. So uh, I would encourage you, if you are have a successful uh, research endeavor, you've published a great paper, you've gotten a big award, please let Sarah and Ryan know so that we can share those. That's important for us to share with uh, the federal government. Uh, we have a bioinformatics core. Um, there are three arms of that, uh, uh, one of which is led by uh, Sue Brown in, in K-State. Uh, Stuart McDonald and Katie Lawrence, and then uh, Devin Kessler here on the Medical Center. And, that, and the goal of that core is to provide support, training, and education in bioinformatics. Um, those are our main cores. And then we also have a developmental research core that supports young faculty and postdocs more in a mentoring 
core, probably not as relevant to this audience as well. So again, I want to encourage you, if you have successes, uh, please communicate with Sarah. Um, that's one of her main goals is to, to really, uh, there are a lot of different avenues in which we can do that, uh, but we want to share those successes with you. Um, so here are some key people that you might interact with over uh, the next year. Hayata Chapman is our assistant director. John Stanford is the associate director. And as always, Sarah probably will be in your ear uh, collecting information about uh, various aspects of the program and driving some of the uh, developmental aspects of that. Uh, the campus coordinators are kind of the heart and soul of our particular program. I hope the coordinators will look at this. This is an old picture. I couldn't find a, good, a newer picture of this. So Janice is still in the picture. We all look young in this picture. Um, and, uh, but these are the key folks that really drive uh, our particular program. So say thanks to your campus coordinator when you get a chance. Okay, so what do we expect from you guys doing research? One, um, make sure that we can contact you. This is a critically important aspect of our ability to communicate with you, not only during while you're in the program, but when you leave the program. We need to know where you're going. What, are your, what did you do? Uh, were you successful? What was the next step that you take? Did you get a job in industry? Did you get a job in academia? We, we're going to follow you for a while um, because that's part of our goal is to understand not only short-term but long-term impact in terms of a particular program. We need to commute. How do you communicate with your research mentors? Um, so this is probably a critical aspect of the from the student standpoint. You're working in a laboratory. You're working with other folks. You're having successes, you're having failures in your research program. You need to talk and work with your mentor. They are the key person to provide you guidance about not only the research that you're doing, but also career goals. So um, don't be afraid to ask your mentor uh, questions about how did you get interested in uh, science and what was the pathway that you took? Where did you do your postdoc? Where did, you know, how old were you when you got your first job? All those are key questions about learning about different aspects of what we do, um, and you know, you shouldn't be afraid to communicate with your faculty mentor. Um, as somebody who mentors a lot of students, I really encourage my students to be aware of all the compliance issues. These are really important. Um, if you're doing animal research, do you, are you aware of all the safety and compliance issues that your mentor has to sort of deal with? Um, and are you uh, in compliance with those? Uh, and we want you to be safe, and we want you to be uh, doing the research in a very safe and approved manner. So um, that's a critical aspect of, of, of being responsible as a scientist. Uh, we want you to share your experiences. Um, you know, if you're working in a laboratory and it's not going well or it's going well, uh, your peers are great resources to talk to and, and to, you know, to learn about what they're doing and approaches that you're using. What are their ideas about what they want to do next? How do you find out information? Uh, so your peers are really good at helping you in that regard. As I mentioned, or we'll talk a little bit about, we'll have an annual symposium, symposium coming up in January. Um, I hope to see all of you there. Um, normally this is a symposium that we have uh, close to 150 students. So you'll have an opportunity to go uh, present a poster, uh, listen to great scientific talks. We've just got most of the um, speakers lined up for our January symposium. We've got some great speakers coming in uh, and looking forward to to hearing uh, about all your research. Give us feedback. Let us know what's working and what's not working. If you're struggling with a particular issue or you're not, you know, not sure about something, we're here to answer your questions and to, you know, get feedback from you. As I mentioned, we need to hear about successes. One thing that I absolutely know is that scientists are terrible about bragging about themselves, about bragging about their successes, and uh, we need to do a better job. That's really important to communicate not only to the government, but to the lay community about what we're doing and why we're doing it and the successes that we're having. And that, I, that is one of the things that I've seen in my entire career is that we're really not very good at it. I'm terrible at it as well. Um, uh, so we need to do a better job. Um, if you do have successes, with, let us know so that we can, we can – uh, communicate with uh, outside agencies that stay in touch. Um, once you're in the K Embry family, you're always in the K Embry family. Uh, we will track you down. We'll talk to your parents. We'll figure out what you're doing. Um, so stay in touch. And then most importantly, have fun. Research should be fun. Um, I, I have students in my lab all the time where they'll get really down because an experiment didn't work. 
or something's not going on. And, and that's really not our goal. Our goal is to make sure that you have fun. Science should be fun. So, uh, for example, when we have a success in the lab, we go celebrate. We go to lunch. We go to happy hour. We do whatever it is because those successes don't come that often. Uh, most of what we do actually are failures. Um, um, I was in a discussion with new graduate students, and one of the questions I was asked was, you know, how, you know, how often do you have failures and what do you do about it? We have failures every single day. Most of the experiments that we do don't work. That's the way science operates. It's really a tough business. So when you do have successes, when you do get something right, go celebrate, have fun. Uh, it's a great aspect of being a scientist because they don't come up that often. As I mentioned, uh, one of the things that we would really love you to do is participate in our annual symposium um, in January every year. This year it's January 12th through the 14th. I would expect all of the students that are here in this audience to be submitting an abstract. Uh, the symposium this year is in beautiful Overland Park, Kansas at the Sheraton, uh, which is actually a great space. Uh, it's a great facility. We've got lots of room. Um, this is a pretty large um, symposium. Uh, we normally have about 300 people attend, uh, so it's not a trivial small uh, environment. Uh, we, in this particular statewide conference, we really focus on the students. So there's a lot of effort in uh, having students present their work both orally. Uh, you'll, have a, you'll have a chance to submit an abstract and be selected for an oral 10-minute presentation in front of 300 people. That's a big deal. Um, and we encourage you to do that. Um, but then you'll also have an opportunity to give a poster. And again, the posters will be the digital format. You can see that in the lower picture here. This is a, a big touchscreen monitor um, that um, you can interact with. And it's great. And the software that we're using for this is improving all the time. And so it's a great way to, to give a, a poster in a really new kind of format. So we'll have that uh, at this particular meeting. We'll also have folks from bioindustry uh, there to talk to and to uh, provide you uh, different kinds of information. Um, one of the things that we're going to do on Friday night now, uh, we just kind of locked this up, is that we're going to have somebody come from NIH to really talk about how, uh, what's a different approach to writing a manuscript and, and um, writing a manuscript in, in uh, the form of a story. Um, and many of us really aren't trained very well in that regard. So uh, Rafael Luna is an expert in this, and he's going to come and talk to the students. It would be a very great interactive sort of environment to talk about how to write a manuscript um, in, in, in relation to telling a story. And most of us are not very good at that. I, I'm uh, absolutely not very good at it at all. Um, so one of the things that we um, need to make sure that we do is that uh, we have to track successes that we have in terms of publications and other sorts of successes to the grant number. This is one of the, this is the way that NIH really determines the success of their funding. Um, how, how, how are people using their funding? So if you, you and your mentor uh, have a great um, semester and you've got enough data to write a paper and you write a paper and it gets accepted, part of that, you can link that paper to our grant number. Um, we really need to have the folks do that. We'll track you down. This is a key measure of our success uh, in terms of how many people are using the money that we've uh, distributed across the state and being successful for that. So our, our number P20 GM 103418 is a critically a important aspect. No manuscript that comes out of the Cambry uh, or uh, community sh sh uh, should be lacking this particular number. Uh, it's an easy way to do it at the end of your paper and we really need that um, as, as a measure of, of our success. So there are lots of ways you can interact with the Kansas Embry. Um, Sarah's done a good job sort of making us uh, social media savvy. So we have a, a website that you can get lots of information on, uh, and it's listed here. Uh, we have a, an active Facebook page. Uh, I looked the other day, we had 478 likes on it. So if you're not, um, if, if you haven't already liked the page, go and like it because there's lots of pictures and other types of information that may appear on that page. Uh, certainly when we, uh, we have lots of pictures of the activities, so you may end up uh, with pictures of you on that particular page. And that's, you may not care about that, but your family does, and they'll want to see you in terms of research settings. So make sure you go and give us a like there. I'll check later on. Uh, Sarah and I both tweet um, on a semi-active basis, depending on what we're doing. There's 
information that comes from that, particularly at the national level. Uh, we have Instagram page, uh, page as well, where lots of pictures appear. Um, we do have a LinkedIn group for uh, KNBRI um, participants, um, and uh, LinkedIn is a great way to sort of build your own personal resume um, and put it online. And we'll have an opportunity uh, at the symposium to help you if you haven't if you haven't taken a picture, photo, headshot, and help you get organized with that. I believe Sarah will be doing that again this year. Uh, in terms of helping you guys get on LinkedIn. And then we also have a YouTube site. So there are lots of different social media aspects. Um, I don't believe we have a Snapchat, Sarah. No, although Sarah does Snapchat a lot. Um, I don't think we have one for the KNBRI page, but uh, certainly go onto the Facebook page and, and give us like, and there's information that comes on. Uh, show your mentors how to get on Facebook if they don't know. Um, there's a lot of information that comes across on Facebook. Okay. So, um, Happy to take any questions. This format is not great for questions, but I think that we can certainly take any questions or if there's any questions from the faculty that you might have. Um, this picture of a mouse is actually a mouse that we use in our research. Um, it's actually a genetic mutation that leads to obesity, and it's a common model for type 2 diabetes. And uh, so um, these are the types of things that we do. Uh, this particular guy was about twice the size of a normal mice because they have a genetic mutation uh, that leads to obesity. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, anybody bold enough to have a question and maybe unmute yourself too. Can I ask a question on behalf of the students because they're too shy? Yes, please. Okay, you're outside the campus, so you'd be a good source for this. How's the best way for them to find a mentor? What would be the criteria that you would use in choosing an undergrad mentor for your research? Yeah, um, I think every university probably solves this a little bit differently. Um, you know, there are different sort of ways. One, I would say if you're just beginning to contact the campus coordinators because they may have some recommendations um, to, find, to, to identify particular mentors that you can get started with, right? Um, student peer advice is also a great way to sort of do this. But as a student, um, what should you be looking for in a mentor um, that um, would be ideal to choose? And I think there are different, different strokes for different folks, but I certainly, I give this advice to a lot of different students. One, do they have a track record of mentoring, right? Um, that's not to say new faculty can't develop into good ones, but there are a lot of good faculty and the track record really speaks for themselves. If, they're, if they've mentored a lot of other students, they've got successes with them. Um, you need a mentor that fits your particular style. Um, so for example, I would say most young faculty are really hands-on mentors. Um, they are in the laboratory right beside you working on stuff and that's, if that's appealing to you, that's great, um, but not everybody's like that. Uh, for example, I'm, you know, I'm in my 20th year, and I'm rarely in the laboratory anymore. Uh, the folks that I have mentoring, uh, new students are my graduate students and technicians, and they have a lot of experience with that. So it's a very different environment. I'm not working side by side, but with my students. Um, you want mentors that uh, are productive and that talk to you about your career development, are interested in you and your career, um, and that's really important as well. And so you should pick a mentor that you're absolutely comfortable talking to them about your particular career, you know, and what advice they can give you. I think that that's uh, a really good sign of a good mentor. Um, but again, it's different strokes for different folks. There are mentors that work in really different ways that are really rigid about how things work in their lab. And there are loosey goosey mentors and there's everything in between. The key thing is for you to find a mentor that you, that you, work with, that you're not afraid to have, um, uh, ask tough questions about, and also work, you know, in, within that laboratory, you know, are there good people in the laboratory? So there's a lot of different ways, but ultimately you should have fun. If you're not having fun in the laboratory, um, you know, maybe that's not a great situation. There are different ways to do that. And that'll happen at every, every stage of your career, graduate school, postdoc, whatever, but industry, you're always going to have a different types of mentors. And some of them are great and some of them are not so great. I, I can give my personal experience. My PhD mentor was not a great mentor and I didn't have the opportunity to really ask. I didn't know enough at the time to ask the right kind of questions. And so my graduate career 
was kind of tough. I, I was ready to quit science. I was really down on it because I wasn't having fun. And it really turned out to be that that particular mentor wasn't very good. And then when I went on to have other mentors and I realized, hey, I really love science and it can be fun and, and the lab can be a great place. So I, I don't know if that answers your question uh, particularly that's sort of a long-winded sort of a explanation about mentors, but certainly um, get a, talk to a lot of people. Uh, I, I know my own son is doing research and he's constantly asking me about different faculty and mentors and, you know, I'm, I'm telling him to, you know, find the best fit for him um, because it may not be the best fit for me. So it's kind of a long-winded answer, but uh, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat and there's a lot of ways to, to mentoring. You just got to find a good fit for you. Any other questions, comments? Is there a question? I see a hand. Is there uh, support for attending the national meeting? Yeah. Yes. Uh, we do have there, we do have, there's a grant that funds that particular meeting. And within that grant, there are about, um, I can't, maybe there's close to 40 travel scholarships that go to undergraduates and, and also young faculty. So there is support. Um, we can give you travel uh, scholarships and the K Embry program will also help support you. We want to take as many people from Kansas to the national meeting. And I think we took 20 to 30 people last year. So there's lots of opportunities um, to do that. And, and there are other, there are other resources that we can use to support your travel to that particular meeting. So yeah, absolutely. You may have to fly with Sarah, which is a downside of it. Uh, <laughs> Doug, we have a question here from Wichita State. Okay. Um, I have a question and I want to know what are some of the research opportunities that you would suggest before for the undergrads before entering the master's? career or master's education. Okay. So one, I would, I mean, you know, if you're entering a master's program, first of all, really identify what's your goal with that master's degree. What are you going to do with that master's degree and how's that master's degree uh, going to help you? I can give you a really, another really good personal bad example. So <laughs> when I started, when I ended my undergraduate career, I, I thought I was going to go to medical school and I realized I didn't want to go to medical school at the very last minute. So I decided to, to apply to a master's program and I got accepted into that master's program. I really had no idea how that degree would help me or what I was going to do with that particular degree. I just knew that that was, and I really wasn't sure I really liked science that much. So I, looking back, I have no idea why I did that. Fortunately, I, quickly learned that I really loved research and um, I sw switched into a PhD program. So my first piece of advice is know what you're going to do with that degree. Um, is that going to lead you to the next step? Um, if that's not the case, then, you know, maybe a PhD program. Most PhD programs don't require a master's degree at this particular point. Uh, but a lot of industry jobs require a master's degree. So really have a good idea what you're going to do with that degree and then get a lot of different uh, opportunities to, uh, work with different mentors, work in different areas, uh, you know, whether it's chemistry or biology, you know, try and get as much varied experience as you can. And that will help you in terms of getting into a particular program. I do a lot in terms of graduate admissions and see lots of different opportunities, but the more research experience you can get, the more diverse research experience I think is, is beneficial. And also to be able to talk about that research. I've seen a lot of students do a lot of research but really not be able to talk about it. Very, um, and that, you know, when you're applying to particular programs, that becomes very important. So, um, you know, be as active as you can. But my first piece of advice is know what you're going to do with that degree. How is that degree going to help you later on to the next step? And if there's any other faculties that want to weigh in and correct me or, um, you know, have a different opinion, please weigh in. Keith always has a different opinion than I do, so maybe I might hear something from Keith. Any All other right. questions? Do we have any, any more questions before we finish up? <laughs> I 
guess you sufficiently covered the topic. I, I put everybody to sleep, I'm sure. <laughs> I will see everybody at the January symposium. It's going to be a great symposium. Uh, we just got the agenda pretty finalized, and it's going to be a great, and I'll make sure the weather is very good. No more um, ice storms. I'll try anyway. Um, I just have a few things before we finish up. Um, this presentation will be, the video of this presentation will be posted on our website. So if you want to go back and look at it, it will be there along with all of our past presentations that we've given. <laughs> and you can watch Dr. Wright give his presentation again. Um, please remember to um, join our social media. And now that Dr. Wright has mentioned it, maybe I might start a Snapchat um, account also, but we'll see. Um, remember we have Facebook and Twitter and um, Instagram, so go check us out. That's all on our website also if you need to find our handles. And um, I had one more thing, but now I can't remember what it was, so I guess it wasn't important. Oh, um, coordinators, please um, remember to send the surveys to your students to complete um, about the seminar today. It's on our website under the undergraduate seminar series. And if anybody has any questions or concerns or successes or any need any information, you can certainly contact me. I'm on the website. Um, let me know what you need. And we appreciate you participating today. Bye, guys. Have a good semester. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.